Well, welcome everyone. I am so excited. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending um, where you're joining us from today. Uh, we are going to get started in just a few seconds, but in the meantime, let us know in the chat, where are you joining us from? Um, and we will get started shortly. Um, welcome to Product Power Play, hosted by PM Dojo. It is a LinkedIn live series where we host industry leaders. Um, and I'm really excited to be speaking with Jana today um, to talk about key inflection points um, that has shaped their career, especially in product and tech, all through some real candid conversations and real conversations. I am Baski Mukherjee, founder of PM Dojo, where we help underrepresented career professionals not only transition into product, but also rise up to product leadership roles um, and get promoted faster. So let's get started. I'm really excited. If you have any questions, put them in the comments. And we do have a small Q&A section towards the end. So happy to take audience questions at that point in time. So welcome, Jana. I am really excited to be talking to you today. Um, just a little bit of an introduction in terms of all the things that you've done. Um, <laughs> you are the founder of PM, uh, sorry, ProdPad. <laughs> I always yeah. kind of mix up the two. Um, and I've been an avid user of ProdPad now for so many years. Um, and ProdPad essentially enables product teams to work smarter. That's how I like to um, frame it in my head. Um, you are the inventor of the now next later roadmap that has literally changed the conversations that take place in rooms where product leaders and product managers along with business executives are thinking about product strategy. Um, and you also co-founded Mind the Product, which is literally one of the largest communities for product people. Um, exactly. And it has like how many, like 300,000 plus people all over the world? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was uh, 300,000 at uh, last count I had, um, but I've lost count because um, I'm no longer actively involved with it, uh, but the community very much lives on. Okay, well, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm really excited. I want to make sure that people are able to see us because I just got a message that people are having a little bit of a struggle. So give me one second. I'm just going to do a thing. No worries. No, looks like we are live. Yeah, okay. It says everyone can see you. Hi, yes. everybody. <laughs> Always happens, you know, with the tech, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really excited. And Jenna, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but more than 10 years ago, you had decided to uh, jump on a call with a random stranger from totally on the other side of the world. That was me <laughs> when I was in this weird career fork in my life. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I remember that conversation. <laughs> I remember that conversation. <laughs> and I think, you know, looking back, I think a lot of the insights that you shared with me that afternoon, at least it was afternoon for me, I think yeah. they were just, you know, they hit the nail on the on the head and they were so correct and so right that I think uh, whatever has happened to me over the last, I think, a decade, I think I owe a big part to you. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, well, I'm really glad we had that chat. We got a chance to to connect back then. Um, and hopefully my advice was helpful. And I mean, you know, look at you now. You've got a, um, a great thing going with PM Dojo. Um, and uh, it feels like you found your way, which I really love. Well, for now, I found my way. And I think you <laughs> always keep on finding your way. I think it's not yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, you're no, never done. <laughs> you're never done. Um, so let's dig in. I think we are going to be talking a lot about, I think, how your career navigated from being a product manager to an entrepreneur, to a builder, mm -hmm. um, not just a product, but of a company. We're going to be talking about, I think, just what does being a woman in tech looks like um, and the self-doubt that comes with it. I think a lot of our audience and listeners are going to relate to that. We're, of course, going to jump in into the roadmap and AI and what does it mean for product management in general? What does it mean for the jobs that are going to be coming in this field? So let's just dig in. There's just tons and tons and tons of questions that I can ask you. So let's start with this, Jana. You know, climbing to the top, um, you know, must have come with self-doubt and times when you might have questioned your path. Um, looking back, you know, can you share a moment that you questioned and what did you learn about yourself and what did you learn from that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've had tons of self-doubt over my my career. I mean, when I started off in product management, um, I was kind of just plucked from customer, like not customer success, but as a, an account manager type role um, was before customer success was really a thing. And, um, uh, you know, they, they spotted that I was good with customers and good with talking to the devs. And so they made me this, they turned me into this role, this, this um, uh, junior product manager. And I'd never heard of it. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And more importantly, there was no one else on the team who uh, was doing product management at this time. So it was this relatively large company, it was three, 400 people, an IPO to tech company uh, back, oh, close to 20 years now. Um, and the, uh, you know, the thing that stood out to me was that I was kind of on my own with this. I tried Googling what product management was or how to do it. And there wasn't really much in the way of guidance. So I did it badly for years, right? My first roadmaps were really junk Gantt chart style things. Cause that's what I could see other people were doing. My first PRD was 80 pages long. No one read it. Right. Um, and so you know, those seriously moments of doubt where I was going, is this even the right thing? I don't know. I found this template and I'm going to turn up to this meeting and try to show that I understood the the, the, the job, but, whoa, you know, really couldn't uh, figure it out from there. Um, and uh, I've had lots of inflection points like that. And by inflection points, I mean like learning moments, right, where I realized that the way that I had been doing something wasn't the right way. You know, one of them came when I moved to London. I took on a job as a more senior product person at a tech company in London. Smaller company, bigger role, more stuff to do. And again, felt out of my depth because so much was put on my shoulders in terms of like how to bring this thing to its next level. And again, there were no other product people around me. And so I had to learn. And so one of the things I did was I started getting this idea that I wanted to set up a product camp event a product camp is like an unconference that uh, it was running in America only at that point in time. And I had this idea that we could maybe run it in London, but I didn't really know how to run an event and I didn't want to do it alone. So I met another product manager once just completely by chance and was having a chat and, you know, bouncing this idea off of having this event and he wanted to get involved as well. And I was like, great, now we can do it. And that person was Simon Cast, who ultimately became my ProdPad co-founder. But one of the things that became this really interesting inflection point that happened over and over and over again was surrounding myself with different product people, product leaders, or just fellow product managers and learning from them how they do stuff and realizing that the stuff that I've been doing, the habits that I've been collected weren't right. And so having to let that stuff go over and over and over again. That is so powerful. And I, and I really love that. I think a lot of times we get so stuck in the things that we're doing yeah. That even if we see that they're not working, we still continue to do that um, just because, right? You know, I think I think their inertia is real and I think change is hard. Uh, it's really hard. I mean, there's so many things that I caught on to the way you were talking. Um, customer success did not also exist back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were account <laughs> managers. Product managers did not exist back in the day. We now have product managers. Yeah. Um, you know, I first started in tech support role, and then somehow within those three months, I was also put into an account manager role that quickly turned into next day being called customer success. And oh, then cool. suddenly there was this another big initiative in the startup that I was in. It was like a six person startup. Um, I was leading that initiative and it happened to be the product that we were launching six months later for the biggest real estate brand and Hence, I came into product and I did everything wrong. Like looking back, I was like, gee, what was it? Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. But I mean, that's that's how you learn. And that's how a lot of us in particularly our cohort got started, uh, which is why it's really good to see so many options for training for product people nowadays. Right. Um, because you can skip a lot of the faff that you and I went through in early days of, you know, what is product management? Am I doing product management? You can skip that now and you can get up a level. Um, but ultimately, nothing stands for um, good product management like experiences. Right. Time on the ground, getting hit by whatever comes at you and figuring out your way through it. But a shortcut to getting experience, the next best thing, if you can't experience it yourself, is to learn from other people's stories. Yeah. And so, you know, my time at Mind the Product was a real accelerant because I surrounded myself with 
incredible thought leaders, product people who were way more experienced than me and, and, you know, had faced all these different challenges. And they would be able to tell their stories of, you know, what they had done, how they learned, what worked, what didn't work. And well, it's not quite the same as being there yourself. You don't have that visceral experience that you take into something. Um, you'd still do gather experiences. You gather insight that you can take to your day-to-day -day job and it levels you up. Um, so one of the best things product managers can do is surround themselves with other product people. Absolutely. And I think this is also very important when, let's say you're also working at a company, right? And if you happen to have other product managers, I think mm -hmm. it's so important to kind of connect with other PMs and share what's working for you, what's not working, how did you approach a certain conversation to get buy-in or, you know, where certain conversation just tanked or maybe yeah. a presentation that tanked. I think that cross-learning, even within product teams, it's really, really powerful, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'd love for you to maybe walk us through briefly about, you know, I think you talked a little bit about your career. How did you get into entrepreneurship? Like, Yeah. yeah. I mean, such a good question. I think I always knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, right? Um, I It was something that I, uh, uh, you know, took a class in business when I was uh, in high school and went into um, a business type um uh, diploma course after school. Didn't really know what I was going to do with that, though. Um, and I actually got some really bad advice early on. Yeah, it was that, that, that uh, grade 10 um, business course. And the teacher said, um, don't ever run a business unless you know what it is that you're actually, you know, you know how to do the things that are really key to that business. Um, and his, his, his example was the fact that he ran a restaurant um, and when a head chef quit, he had to lean on his own cooking experience, his own chefing experience to be able to pull it off and, and you know, run that business. And I remember that actually held me back for a while because I was sitting here going, what am I actually good at? I don't know, I'm a classic jack of all trades, master of none. Um, what kind of business would I run? Um, and it wasn't until I got into product management and then started working for closer and closer to leadership. And I realized, oh, this product management thing is all about surrounding yourself with good people um, empowering them to make good decisions, um, getting out of their way, giving them autonomy. And then, you know, when you're ready, being ready to muck in and learn something if it's needed, but don't hold yourself back from running something just because you can't do everything in that business. Um, and so that transition to um, uh, running ProdPad, it was a very slow transition, right? I, I started building ProdPad while I had a job as a product manager. Originally, it was just a tool to solve our own problems, scratch our own itch. Uh, and so I uh, started building up what was the, the basic bare bones of Broadpad and how we were going to get out to market while I still had a day job. So I didn't quit my day job until I knew there was already something there. But I started looking at what other companies, other SaaS businesses were doing at the time and, um, you know, what, what, what I was learning from the different leaders I was working with and uh, adopting that, adapting that to the Broadpad work that I was doing. And so when I left my job to go focus on Broadpad, I already had an idea as to what the journey might look like. You know, being a CEO is very much like surrounding yourself with good people and empowering them and getting out of their way and sometimes having to muck in and do whatever, right? Um, so a lot of it actually transferred really nicely uh, from from one role to the next. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's been a um, uh, an interesting, but I think relatively smooth journey into it, considering. That is awesome to hear. And, and so do you recommend... You know, like you, you went into it while you still had a job. Yeah. Um, I went to it when I didn't have a job. <laughs> I gave myself yeah. three months to prove my business idea. Um, yeah. you know, with Even on the financial side of things. Um, what What is your recommendation? What would you recommend? Would it you depends. Have the same way? It, it depends did. on what you're building, right? So um, with mine, uh, because it was a new space, it wasn't like we were filling this demand that already existed. Part of it was just some R&D time, right? And so uh, we had the luxury that we had, uh, myself and my co-founder had day jobs. We were both head of product at two different companies. Um, and we had spare time on the weekend and we had the means to buy separate laptops and go do the prod pad work separately from the day job stuff, right? This is before we had kids and lives and everything like that, right? So yeah, what else are we gonna do besides hack on this site until 3 a.m. and then do a day job throughout the day? Um, so there was definitely some, uh, it, it could only have worked at that point in time. And also because we were doing it that way, 
it took time, right? We, we couldn't build every day. We couldn't, we didn't have the energy for that. So you'd build on weekends and evenings and you wouldn't do it every evening. You just sort of hack away on it when, you know, inspiration struck. And so the first uh, year of ProdPad, it didn't even have a name. It was just this tool that we used, which, you know, didn't have ability to log in or, um, you know, or, or like add extra users or do other stuff like that. It was just very, very basic bare bones just as a tool internally only. Um, and then once we started realizing that this was useful for people on our team, right, other people wanted to join this thing and collaborate in it, uh, we started making it up uh, to the point where it looked and felt like a proper SaaS tool. It just didn't have a website. Um, and so we spent this time in R&D um, kind of going slow. And we could only do that because we had the day job to pay for the bills and we had the time to take out to do this stuff. You know, some products can't be built that way, right? Sometimes you need, like if you're building a marketplace, for example, you need to build out something good enough that gets everyone to join at the same time. You can't just dribble it out the door like we did um, and have, you know, one customer join one month and the next one join the next month and be like, oh, this is fine, it'll grow. Um, you need to build out something and do all that um, expensive R&D work and all that expensive marketing work and kind of do it as a, maybe not a big bang, but you need to make a bigger um, bang than we did. Um, other people don't have the luxury, the privilege of having a day job that allows them to do work at night, right? There might be things that are blocking you. You might have a family, you might have a life. You might not be in your twenties and have all that energy. Um, I certainly couldn't do it again now. So um, yeah, I, I uh, recommend people take a look at stories from both sides and decide what works best for them and the aspirations that they have, how quickly they wanna move and what they're willing to give up if they are going to take funding and get started really quickly because there are trade-offs for that as well. Uh, I, I, I love that, you know, um there's always a cost, I think, to every decision that we make, right? And I always, this is something I think one of my mentors had told me years ago, um, Jana, and she said, you know, there's always a cost to every decision you're going to make. The, the difference is going to be, are you going to be paying it now or are you going to be paying it later with interest? And I think that was kind of really fundamentally, it shifted how I thought about a lot of decisions. Were, was every decision correct? No, I have tons of blunders. But I think, you know, most decisions, I think, in life are irreversible. And, and I think that's been another thing that I've kind of, I think, lived by to just make sure that I don't pressure myself and get those different perspectives. And it's fascinating to hear how you, how, how you started. Um, I have this question, and I know that this was something that a lot of people asked me to ask you. And that is, as a woman in tech, where we have to fight harder to prove our worth a lot of the times. Um, you know, have you felt underestimated at any point in your career? Um, you know, and how did you get that power back to assert that value? Um, and I, I heard you speak about something that really resonated with me. I think it was a few years ago and you said, being a woman in tech is not a woman issue, it's a business issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's like 100%, 100% true. And I think even like this week, we've heard of Helena Helmer Helmerson, she's the CEO of um, H&M. She stepped down and she said, I just don't have the energy to continue. I mean, it's really sad. I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to the point of, have I ever felt um, held back as a woman in tech? Earlier on in my career, I definitely felt more of that. Uh, but as I progressed, as I worked my way up and basically had the ability to surround myself with teams that I wanted to work with, right? When I got my first job, I took the first job that would pay me anything that was decent and go from there. But as I got uh, better at what I was doing, I was able to get choosier and I was able to um, spend time understanding whether the team I was joining was the right team. And I actually started off with some pretty toxic companies early on in my career and they got less toxic and less chaotic as I went on. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, there was always a level of, um, tech broness and chaos when it came to working for tech companies. But when I went off to run ProdPad, um, I had an idea as to what I wanted to be and what I didn't want to be because I'd seen spaces that weren't good for that. Uh, and so, you know, I've been able to surround myself for the last, you know, more than 10 years now building ProdPad um, with the right sort of people that lift me up and I'm able to lift other people up. 
Um, and I think it's not just women in tech, it's looking at uh, minorities or uh, different sexualities or different uh, differences in any way, uh, but you're able to create a space that allows good, smart people to do their best work together, regardless of their background. That is such an important point because I think the more we have folks um, you know, who are creating this space for others, I think it almost works like a flywheel, right? And then yeah. you create that legacy and you create that safe space for others who are, you know, maybe the, the next generation to come in. Yeah. And I think this is why having those role models is so important. You have to, you yeah. need to see people like you who have, yeah. you know, walked in, in your shoes, right? Absolutely. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think it's really important to interview the company that you are looking to work for as much as they're interviewing you, right? Ask them, what happened to your predecessor? Why did they leave? Um, ask them to see how work is rewarded, how work is merited. Um, you know, ask about a feature that they've launched and see if they, if just the product manager takes credit or if they share it, right? Um, ask what happened the last time they failed, right? Figure out what the company is like. You have every right to ask those questions about what it's going to be like there for you um, and have a look around the room and see, you know, if there are other women or minorities or whatever in the room. Um, and if you're the first one in, then it might be a little bit scary. Doesn't mean it's a no-go, but definitely ask the question as to what's going on in that space. 100%. Uh, and this is something that, you know, like even in PM Dojo, all of the fellows, we like a big part of coaching comes down to this, right? It's not just a grilling match that happens during interviews, like make sure you're prepared with, you know, some of those questions, the non googleable questions like that is really going to help you understand what is it going to be like, like a day yeah. in the life for you out there, right? Um, I, I, I absolutely, absolutely love, um, I think your questions, I think, you know, how things have been rewarded, I think, you know, where, why someone was let go, I think that is a really interesting question. I think there was this, someone had asked me once, I was interviewing a candidate, and uh, he had asked me, um, what is, uh, what is Bosky on her worst day to work with? <laughs> Excellent. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I just, I was stumped, but, you know, I took a few moments, I think, to think about it, but I was like, that's such a fabulous question, because if you're going to be working, you know, with me, and I'm going to be your boss, I, I think you should know, what yeah. is it like? Um, and so I kind of shared, and then I asked him, I said, what is it going to be like, you know, having you in our team on your worst day? And, you know, I, I just had a blast working with him. We eventually hired him, but right. I think it's so interesting to have these kind of questions. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. You know, that sort of harks back to what happened uh, in 2020. Um, like a lot of people, uh, my, you know, the, the working state that I had changed, and I realized that I couldn't focus. I couldn't sit at my desk. My job previously involved a lot more moving around around and getting out there and seeing people. Uh, and I uh, realized that I uh, was completely dysfunctional when it came to work. And I was trying to figure out what was going on there. And turns out, after talking to the doctors, I was diagnosed with ADHD. And so this was a big learning moment. And it started not excusing, but explaining so much of how I was working and what I was, uh, you know, how I worked and how I interacted with other people and, you know, why my... Um, desk was covered in post-it notes and everything. And so one of the things that I did was I told my team immediately, right? I made sure that everybody knew, hey, by the way, I've got ADHD and this is what I'm good at and this is what I'm not good at. And it allowed me to make space in my team for people to support me, um, to make sure that my ADHD tendencies didn't cause a problem, right? I'm terrible at note taking. And, um, you know, uh, there's other people on the team who are way better at organizing initiatives rather than me who's better at kicking them off. Um, but also what it did, it created space for other people in the team to talk about their own neurodiversities. And so we were able to work more honestly with each other. And it was only after I actually came out saying, this is what's up with me, that I started hearing from other folks on my team I did the same thing on Twitter as well. Um, at that time, I basically said, is anybody else, I don't know, ADHD and in product or founders? And turns out it's like everybody, right? <laughs> Hundreds of replies, lots of people either definitely diagnosed, self-diagnosed or suspected. Uh, and, um, you know, I realized that is very much a, a trait that a lot of people in my space share, which I think is why the product and entrepreneur space has always been quite comfortable for me. 
That is uh, so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I had, I, I think I had seen that tweet uh, when you shared, Jana. Was it hard to come and tell your team about it? Did you struggle with that? Or did you no, like it, was, it was actually really enlightening and um, really fun. Uh, you know, one of the things, like as I was saying, I've surrounded myself with really good people. You know, everyone on the team we've hired and they are all wonderful, caring people. And so, um, you know, it's really great to be lifted up by folks and say, you know, where they go, OK, yeah, I understand that. And, you know, here's what I've got going on as well. And here's how I can help you. One of the things I did uh, was I found somebody on my team who'd already been leading the dev side and she'd come up through the company as originally a um, uh, front end developer uh, uh, and designer. And um, I, I plucked her out of development and made her my chief of staff. So she was there as my right hand person for a while to um, help me uh, help the company move forwards. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I ended up making her my COO. Um, she's just absolutely powerful. She's the the opposite to me, though, where I am, um, you know, visionary and disorganizing, set off piles of chaos. She can understand it and pick it up and line it all up into an operational sense. And so it's finding that match that really, really empowered me to do more and empowered our team to do so much more as well. We're a lot stronger because of Danielle and her role. That is uh, really, really powerful. I, I think, you know, oftentimes when we talk about diversity, we often tend to forget about neurodiversity. And, and I think that had been something that was really important for me. I think the first time um, when I was working at a company many, many years ago, um, we actually brought in everyone together because uh, we found out that one of our team members um, actually had bipolar. And... Um, and it was important that I think as a team, we got together to talk about it. And I think that brought, encouraged a lot of other people to talk about, I think, some of the, some, some of the things that they suspected they were having mm -hmm. or even feel encouraged that, you know, maybe we need to go to the doctor and just see, maybe we're going to get a diagnosis. And so there were some, some folks who came on the autism spectrum. There were some folks on the bipolar, ADHD. And it just kind of, I think, got the elephant out of the room. And it made that team so strong. Um, and that team became, I think, one of the best performing teams in the company. And I think having those real conversations is so powerful and empowering. That's a great story. I love that. <laughs> um, let's move on to the now, next, later roadmap. Uh, it's been absolutely my favorite. Um, I cannot tell you how the conversations have shifted. The initial struggle to adopt has been high, but I think once the teams get it and once you know the senior leadership gets it, I think it's just so powerful just to think about prototyping a roadmap instead of mm -hmm. thinking it like a Bible and this Gantt chart, which yeah. I think all of us are so <laughs> used to it. Um, Jana, tell us a little bit about how the idea sparked. I mean, it's yeah. different. It's very different. Yeah, and um, you know, it came about because I used to do timeline road mapping. And I thought that, that was the right way of doing it. Uh, I have examples of my old roadmap, which uh, looked gorgeous. My bosses loved when I could give them that level of certainty, but was always setting me up for failure, right? It was always, I uh, was never able to deliver everything on time. But the thing is, I just assumed that it was me who could deliver on time and I just needed to add more buffer or, you know, get closer to the developers or, you know, just do better project management delivery stuff. And it wasn't until we digitized that and built that into the very early version of ProdPad and we started sharing that with our first few very early beta customers. And people loved it. They loved being able to have this tool that they could drag and drop and put their ideas on and drag them out and that sort of thing. Um, but the the result, the, the, the feedback started coming back in about a month later where people started saying, hey, so I've been using this, this roadmap, but I wanna be able to like select everything that I put in this first month and just move it over by a bit. And had I just, listen to the customer straight up. I would have just built some like multi-select drag and drop tool. Um, but what I actually did was realize, well, that's actually difficult to build. And also, if you're going to move it over, are you going to move it over the next month? Like, why, why is everyone wanting to move everything over? It's because no one delivered on stuff. We started asking the five whys and realized that none of these product people, even ones who were way more successful and um, higher up in the world than me, weren't able to deliver the roadmaps. And I was like, wait, it's not just me, it's all of us. So if people aren't delivering their roadmaps on the timeline that they said they were, why do we have this timeline? Why don't we just focus on the order in which we're tackling things? 
And so myself and Simon sat down in a cafe, and this is before, way before we had an office, um, and started sketching out ideas. Like, what would this look like if we didn't have to have this timeline constraint at the top, but we still had this concept of time and the order of and the level of confidence you have in work, and came up with three columns. And that three columns ultimately became the now, next, later roadmap. And people loved it when we launched it because it gave them this freedom to build a roadmap, still articulate what is strategically important, what order they need to tackle things, and then update it when it's completed with the dates, right? It didn't mean that they couldn't um, build things in the right order. They weren't using the resources. It was actually focusing them on that. And so it really empowered people um, to move away from the traditional timeline-based roadmap. That, that's like amazing. And I'm going to share the link to ProdPad um, on LinkedIn. I, I think for any product team, if you know you are struggling with road mapping or the different versions of roadmap and the granularity and mm -hmm. having challenge getting just by, and um, it, it's, I think, worth checking out uh, ProdPad. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'll send you a link because um, you can you can go straight to ProdPad and try out the tool. But we also have a guide that we've just recently released, and it's the guide to moving off timeline roadmaps and onto now, next, later format. Because we have had literally thousands of people come to our door, and some of them really struggle with it, and a lot of them actually just get right on board with it. It's it's a smooth transition. But for those people who have those struggles, you might run into various stakeholders who are stuck in the old ways of working, right? Whether it's a boss or your investors or your sales team or your marketing team or your customers or whoever it is, we've written a guide that outlines how you might uh, win them over, show them the light with a now next later roadmap. And we've also created a, uh, a like a PowerPoint presentation that you can use. We've given notes and everything. You can use this to present to your team about why you wanna move to a now next later. So, um, Definitely check that out. If you go to prodpad.com slash uh, downloads, you'll be able to access it there. Uh, but also try out the tool itself. It's a place to just try your own roadmap. We've got a sandbox and stuff like that. Absolutely. I am going to be sharing that link. And of course, it also has AI built-in features, um, which I absolutely love. It's uh, It's been something that's been a hot favorite for a lot of the fellows in the Accelerator program. And I think for this cohort, they, they're going to start to use. And I'm really, really excited about that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about what we've been able to do with AI. Um, we, we've been using GPT since before it was cool, right? Like back in the, the you know, before it was GPT 3, 3.5 sort of thing. And we, we had it for some limited limited um, use cases, things like being able to deduplicate stuff in your backlog or make suggestions of um, uh, different ideas you might want to link together with feedback that you've heard. And that was actually working quite well until the proper GPT landed, right? I think it was April last year when GPT-4 came out and all of a sudden it was like, oh, wow, you can really do some cool stuff with this. So we started implementing that in ProdPad as well. And we didn't want to just like what some of the first things we did was like, well, you can take the stub of an idea. You know, if you have like an idea that's stuck to your your monitor, like this could be a great idea, but you need to work out more detail. We realized it could help you brainstorm what might else go into the idea. It could help you brainstorm um, different um, uh, user stories, right? Because user stories is kind of just drudge work. And so we're using AI to remove that drudge work. And this is where I see the future of AI for product managers is to get them less focused on the writing the specs and writing out the, the, the different pieces that need to be communicated and actually spending more time talking to customers and dreaming up and then testing those different things. The actual writing it out part, you don't need a human sitting there doing that. That's expensive time. Product managers are highly skilled and could be spending the time talking to customers and working on strategic thinking. Um, so we built stuff that allowed you to generate stuff, but we also wanted to build something that was a little bit more like a sidekick. And I see AI really, really exploding in this area um, and will continue doing so, where it's like AI is your sidekick. You can turn to it and ask it questions. So things that we built into ProdPad, the first piece was like, well, I've got this idea. Is this idea any good compared to the vision that we've written? And it'll help you give help give you critical feedback as to whether the idea is actually any good and deserves to be on your roadmap or not. Um, or it could take a look at your roadmap and tell you if your roadmap's any good. We ran this on our own roadmap when we first built it and immediately came back and said, yeah, these initiatives, they make sense based on where you say you're trying to go. Um, these ones, you know, maybe tweak some language here. We're like, yeah, it makes sense. And then it pointed out a couple of things going, these don't actually make sense, right? These don't align with what you're trying to do. And one of them I was able to rewrite and go, okay, if I explain it better, 
then it makes sense to our, what, what we're trying to do here. So we improved our roadmap that way. And one of the things we looked at and said, this isn't actually a good initiative. It's right. So it pointed out how we could improve our own roadmap with basically just a click of the button. Um, and so we're making that sort of thing possible for everybody else. Um, there's a lot more happening in that space as well. So happy to chat more about that. It's 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 like I, I love that you brought that up, right? Because I think a lot of times and for the longest period of time, I think PMs were so focused on the delivery, right? It was just that end. And that's why a lot of the focus was like, okay, you know, as a PM, I need to make sure I'm working with my engineering, I'm delivering, I'm delivering my sprint backlog. And a lot of times I think, especially in um, companies that were not very product uh, led or the product mm -hmm. culture wasn't there, a lot of times you would have a few like you know, when I would interview for a role, they'd be like, I, I would ask, like, what is the biggest challenge in product? And I was like, well, the velocity is not there in engineering. And I'm like, well, that's not really a product problem, is it? Like, <laughs> the engineering leader in this, like, what questions yeah. are we asking him or her? And I, I think to what you say, I think, you know, the reason why PMs are hired is to bring value, right? To solve that real problem that is in the market, but also bring value to the business. And the more we kind of get sucked into this grunt work or drudge work, you yeah. know, we can't really level up to be thinking. And we do need that focus time because building products, it's, it's, it's a craft, right? It's, that's why it's a product craft and yeah. we have to kind of rise up above that. Um, since we're talking about AI, um, and you, I think, you know, the question that I was going to ask you, I think you already kind of brought up a lot of the things that AI can do within product. But I think the question that I have for you is, you know, there are gazillions of frameworks and best practices in product <laughs> shared yeah. on a daily basis everywhere across all social media. That's like the topic in pretty much every single event or panel um, that happens. And yet really good, awesome teams struggle to build good products. Mm -hmm. A lot of products suck and they fail. So where do you see AI coming in in this space and how can it help PMs? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, to your point, uh, you know, product managers today are no longer needing to be so technical. They don't need to code. Um, you don't need to have a CS degree. Um, but, you know, going back 20 years ago, that was kind of an expectation that you had a technical edge to you. It's becoming less and less important because of things like no code tools and the, the fact that going forwards, we're going to be able to build product just by dictating it. Right. Um, hey, I've got an idea. How about this? And Theoretically, there's no reason that we couldn't have things building for us. We've already got the very seeds of that, right? We're starting to see some interesting tools that do that sort of thing. But, you know, when you think about what a product manager needs to do, they need to make something that's technically feasible. They need to make something that's usable. And they need to make something that's desirable or valuable to the users and to the business. And AI, one of its strengths is that it tends towards the average, right? It doesn't dream up new stuff if you don't give it the right prompts. And actually, as a matter of fact, coming towards the average is great if you're trying to make something technically feasible. You don't want surprises. Surprises are bugs. Um, if you want something usable, like you don't want to recreate entirely new ways of doing things in the app most of the time. You actually just want a path to allowing them to do the thing they want to do that's similar to how they do it in other apps as well, right? Like a login page. How many times have you spec'd out a login page in your life and you realize, wait, this is just like the other login pages that I've created in the past. Um, eventually, you should be able to say, yes, it has a login page and it's able to build it for you. And so things like usability, it's going to help make things more um, uh, standard, standardized for everybody else. And so really, it comes down to for the product manager to figure out that you know, 1% or 10% or whatever it is that makes your app desirable, makes it valuable, makes it stand out from all the other apps. Because if you can build an app with a click of a button or a snap of a fingers, there's going to be tons of apps and they're all going to be feasible and technically workable. They're all going to be um, usable. They're all going to be very similar in many ways because they're all copying off the same body of work that we put into it. But what makes it desirable, valuable, and the product managers, the ones who really stand out down the lines are the ones who uh, can understand the market trends, can talk to customers, and are actually more like curators 
right? If you can make 10 apps and you've got to figure out, well, which one of these is the one that's going to stand out? If you can recreate your features in you know, 20 different ways before you pick one, which of those is going to be most compelling? And you'll only know that by talking to the customers. And I don't think that that talking to the customers and understanding what they're saying is going to be replaced uh, anytime soon. I think there's always going to be a place for humans to be talking to humans and figuring out what their needs and wants and desires are and uh, creating whatever that means in the future products and services to suit their needs. I, I, I love what you said there, Jana. I think there were a few things that stood out to me. I think one, um, you know, how AI a lot of the roles are going to become AI enabled. So just like how the PMs will have to work differently, mm -hmm. you know, design is the same thing's going to happen on design. The same thing's going to happen within engineering as well. Uh, you know, development is going to look very different. I mean, already development looks very different from back in the day, I think when you and I started. Mm -hmm. uh, right? Engineering looks very different. And so I think, I think it's not about like AI taking the jobs away. Um, but if you want to still have a job and you still want to be a great PM, product building will remain. But I think yeah. how we leverage some of the latest tools like AI or tomorrow, maybe there's going to be something else to really elevate, I think, how we think. Right. Yeah. And I think I think learning how to think critically, learning the collaborative side of things and I think the interpersonal skills. And I think those are some of the skills that are so important to really, I think, focus um, yeah. Right. It's I, I absolutely love it. Um, and product managers are going to have to learn to uh, grow up and grow with the different um, skills that are required of them as they go. I mean, when I started in product management, um, I was really good at writing a really detailed spec. And the reason why I needed to do that was because we had this big waterfall process and you couldn't get anything moving unless you could write that really detailed spec. I have not written an 80 page PRD for a very, very long time. Um, but I could, but I learned to drop that skill and actually realized that there were new ways of communicating with my team that meant I didn't have to do that. Um, you know, sure, I know UML, but I don't have to anymore, right? Just like developer uh, product people of today, like uh, of, of yesterday and today. Um, sure, you might know how to code still, but you probably don't need to, right? Design, um, copywriting. Um, you don't actually have to be good at this stuff anymore in order to figure out, or in order to be good at picking out what is good. 100%. 100%. You know, I think my my, my, my nine-year-old will often kind of tell me, like, he's he's joined his new school here in the Bay Area, and he's like, you know, Mama, I'm learning how to learn. I'm learning how to think, and I'm learning how to be. I think the, these are, like, the core principles of his new school, and I said, I just love that's it. Great. That that's so that's a really good handle on what he's doing, too. <laughs> You know, it's, yeah. And, you know, like tomorrow he's giving a demo of what he's built to everyone. And I'm like, wow, okay. I wish oh, I had that. that. <laughs> I wish I learned how to demo at that age. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Jana, one question, um, since we are talking about AI and the field, you know, do you, do you get a sense or are you thinking about how, um, the job itself, like what kind of jobs are within the product space? you are thinking might be coming up in the next few years as AI gets more and more entrenched? Yeah, I mean, I think product management um, in, in that sort of space, you're going to see product managers who specialize in AI and working with AI as a uh, as a tool within our own tools. I mean, I can't really think of any modern SaaS today that hasn't dropped in, you know, the purple sparkly button that we see everywhere. Um, and so, you know, right now it's being put together by regular PMs who are just figuring it out, but there's going to be people who specialize in uh, working with and testing and building AI tools. Um, and also, I think there's going to be more focus on um, uh, 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 product managers who understand the source data. Um, you know, what is it that makes your AI uh, special, it's because it has access to something that you've given it. Otherwise, you're just putting a wrapper on GPT. And there's some really cool apps that have come out that are basically just wrappers on GPT, but I think they're going to wear thin. Um, the ones that are really going to be strengthened are the ones that have uh, the ability to understand the context in which they're trying to help you. Like for Prodpad, for example, we have set up our, our, API, uh, our um, AI to be a chatbot that you can talk to, but it knows everything in your Prodpad backlog. So it knows what your product is today, where it is you're trying to go, what your vision is, what your objectives are, what all your ideas and feedback is. And so you can ask it questions like, 
you know, tell me what sort of things people are asking for these days. Can you summarize last week's feedback? Can you tell me how that aligns with our upcoming OKR? Can you tell us what we should be working on based on you know, the, the objective that we're trying to hit? So you can ask it these questions and it's useful because it has the context of that underlying data. And so there's gonna be product managers who are focused on making sure that the right data is there and it's fed to the AI in a way that it can do something with it. I, I love it. Uh, I would love to. I, I, this is going to be really interesting. I think as uh, some of the fellows in PM Dojo, like this current cohort, they're starting to get a lot of the customer feedback and the beta testing. Like I'd love for them to, I think, ask that question um, in ProdPad and see what kind of insights they get. Because I think that just kind of, I think, shortens a lot of the things. It's, it's almost like your second brain, right? Like at least it helps you start to think about where do you even start, right? Yeah. What is it that my starting base. Love it, love it, love it. Um, one last question as we are trying to wrap up today's uh, episode, Chana. If there is one piece of advice that you would like to give, um, both to folks who are trying to get into product, um, as well as experienced PMs who are trying to, I think, navigate their next path, uh, next step in their career, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, I think the really key thing. Um, is to feed your curiosity, right? Uh, the best product managers I know are uh, curious and tenacious, right? They, they look at problems and they say, well, how might we solve this, right? How might I learn more about this so that I can break this down? Uh, and they're tenacious, right? They don't stop. They, they, they're, you're gonna hit so many roadblocks. You're gonna find that so many of your experiments and things that you were holding dear don't work. And you've gotta let that go and um, be ready to try three other experiments, 10 other experiments until you actually crack that. Um, and uh, you know, I think in the world of AI going forwards, there's so much that we don't know about what it's gonna be able to do, right? This is a step change. We're right at this really interesting um, precipice. And so stay curious, ask questions about how it might be used for good or for bad and how you can help shape the world in front of you using tools like this. That is absolutely wonderful. It's very, very inspiring. I am really, really excited um, to see, I think, what the field looks like. I'm really curious about, I think, even ProdPad and how you how you and your team, you know, grows and evolves the product. Jenna, this has been such an eye-opening conversation. I absolutely loved it. As always, I absolutely love talking to you. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Um, yeah, and likewise. Thank you for having me. This has been great. A hundred percent. You know, pleasure is all mine. And for everyone who dialed in today, joined us today, thank you so much. Again, if there are any questions that you have, feel free to drop it in the comments. Um, I'm sure that, you know, we will continue um, to respond to some of those answers. Um, stay tuned for the next episode. Um, and again, have a wonderful day and have an amazing day. And until then, see ya. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye for now.